I, uh, I bring greetings from Southwest Side Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, Gabby and I, we haven't uh, joined yet. We're still not sure whether or not God's called me to ministry position. I'm looking at some and I'm thinking that He is. I just feel that call in my heart. But there at Southwest Side, we have this couple, and they're from Paris, Tennessee. And they're about, uh, they're middle-aged, and their uh, children have just now gotten married, and they have grandchildren, <coughs> about three and four-year-olds, and I think they kind of took us in to uh, take care of us. But we always tell everybody there that if it weren't for Tennessee, Texas wouldn't exist. <laughs> everybody there in Texas, you know, they have the biggest flags and the biggest hats and the biggest boots. But uh, here in Tennessee, we have the biggest hearts. Amen. So, Amen. That's what I tell them, that if it wasn't for Tennessee, heck, it wouldn't be this. But anyway, I bring greetings from the Southwest side, and I also bring greetings from Southwestern Theological <coughs> Seminary. And I'd like to, on behalf of them, I'd like to thank you all, because if it weren't for the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention, the seminaries actually wouldn't exist, but also, do more than that, but actually pay half of our tuition. So your giving is actually paying for me to get to go to school, and for myself to get to learn, and many others, missionaries, those who are being trained in music, those who are being trained to be pastors, those who are being trained to be the leaders of the convention, are actually learning off of the money that you get each day. And a portion of the budget of Lakewood Baptist Church goes to what's called the Sparkle Program. So I, on behalf of them, I always want to say thank you that because it's because God bless us that we're able to keep preaching <coughs> giving out his word. And this morning I'd like for us to turn to Genesis 49. And I'd like for us to go to Genesis 49, the first book in the Bible. And it's interesting to note that even at the beginning of the Bible, there in the very beginning, God had a plan, and since he's from eternity to eternity, the ancient of days, the Bible will call him. He's from, he has no beginning of days, nor does he have any ending of days. He knows all things, just like this ring that I wear. It's like a circle, it's a circle that has no beginning, nor does it have an end. So Jesus and God, which we'll see later, that Jesus is God, we'll prove that. But God has no beginning nor end, and he knew all things in the beginning. So let's read in Genesis 49, let's just read verse 10. Now Jacob, now there's Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. And Jacob's name becomes Israel. His son. That's Abraham. And then he begot Isaac. And then he begot Jacob. And Jacob has twelve sons. The twelve sons and twelve sons of Jacob. Well, he's blessing them before he's about to die. He's going to bless them. And he's telling each one the specific blessing that they're going to receive. And to Judah, he's giving the blessing of being the ruler. Judah will be the ruler of the people. God has already designated that Israel will one day have a king. And this king will come from Judah. This king will eventually be David. King David. He comes from the tribe of Judah. King Saul, the first king, this was the king that Israel asked for because Israel wanted to be like the rest of the world. They wanted to have a king like all the other nations. And Saul was who God gave from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul was not the one who is really the one who would truly save Israel, but God gave them the king because they asked for it. And he did turn out the way they planned. And then after that, Saul raised up David. But here it says in verse 10, The scepter shall not part from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now the word Shiloh is word in Hebrew. You know, you might have heard of Shiloh Baptist Church here and there. There's one close to where my grandmother lives, and she's here today. And I was wondering, what does Shiloh mean? Well, Shiloh's word in Hebrew, and probably either means peace, or probably is reflexive, I guess a reflexive pronoun, that means him to whom it belongs. So here he says, the scepter, which is a symbol of royalty and rule and authority and reign, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. Now Shiloh, let's say Shiloh means until him to whom it belongs. 
So it's saying that the staff's not far from Judah until him to whom it really belongs comes. And to him, this one that's coming, shall be the obedience of the people. Now the word peoples, the other word for peoples is Gentiles. Now that's what Gentiles means. Or really Gentiles means nations. Okay? Let's turn now to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Jump up way into the Old Testament. Now we're already at the point where Israel has had their kings, and they sinned, they haven't kept the Old Covenant, and they're about ready to be sent into their country in captivity. But God gives them a promise. This is more or less 700 B.C., somewhere around there. I'll give it less than 100 years, I'm not sure. I haven't got that far yet in the Old Testament. So you have to forgive me. But in Isaiah chapter 9, it says thus, now this is a prophecy of prophet Isaiah concerning Israel before they're about to go into captivity. He's been prophesying all this punishment. And yet, in punishment, there is a hope. But there will be no more bloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. Now those are two tribes of Israel. They're in the northern extremes in a place called Galilee. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles, or nations. Gentiles also means nations. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light, and those who live in a dark land, the light will shine. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they buy the spoil, for you shall break the yoke of their burden, and staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor is at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So, they're promised the son will be a son of David. His name will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace to his government. To the increase of the government, there will be no end. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Let's go a few chapters over to Isaiah chapter 49. Same book, same man, given the word, but another chapter later on. And he says in chapter 49, Isaiah says, Listen to me, O islands. Yeah, islands. Islands are going to be receiving a precious message. And pay attention, you peoples, from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand he has concealed me. He has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. Pay attention to this verse. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will show my glory. But I said, I have told in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely the injustice due to me is with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. So here, Israel is called God's servant. They're a select arrow, hidden in his quiver, a precious arrow. It says, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Now we know that the sword is a metaphor for God's word. God has entrusted Israel, his precious child, the ones that Abraham, see, Abraham followed God, Abraham believed in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So it actually wasn't an exclusive decision, but it was rather Abraham believed, and God is choosing to bring a word through their mouths. That's the Old Testament scriptures. See, Israel are the guardians and were the guardians of the scriptures. But then picking back up in verse 5, he says, And now, so we're, we're going to say something else, And now, says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, so 
this is another servant. Who could this servant be? This servant says to bring Jacob or Israel. Jacob is Israel. His name was changed to Israel. So this is a man, this is another word for Israel. To bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, Oh, it is too small a thing. So this is the Father God is talking to this servant. This unnamed servant. For it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to the despised one, to the one implored by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise. Princes will also bow down because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen. Let's go to Isaiah 52. In Isaiah 52, we have another prophecy about that servant. Verse 13, it says, in verse 13, Behold my servant, will prosper, he will be high, and lifted up, and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle, which is a metaphor in the Old Testament, when they sacrifice the animal, they take the blood and sprinkle it off, sprinkle it on the altar to purify the altar. <coughs> then they would go along with the sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people. But it says in verse 15, Isaiah 52, verse 15, Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will hear. And they will understand. Who has this picking up the history? Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide the face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourge we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. You see, he was in the tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. It says, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, Jews often argue that this suffering servant, as he is often called, is the Israel itself. It's a metaphor for Israel. And yet it says here that he will die for the sins of my people. So how can Israel die for the sins of Israel? And then it says... Yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So whoever this man is, he's going to be a perfect man. He's going to be perfect, live a sinless life. Israel couldn't possibly have fulfilled that prophecy. Because as we know, the first part of this book, all it's talking about is how Israel is sinful. Sinful, sinful, sinful. Disobedient. After not obeying the Israel. So this is going to be someone else. Let's turn to Jeremiah, the next book. It's just the next book over. Jeremiah, I think, was a contemporary of Isaiah. Let's go to 31. Jeremiah 31. Let's go to verse 31. And it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, my husband had been declared the Lord. But 
this is the covenant which y'all make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, and the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Now it says here, they will not teach again each man his neighbor and brother. But we all know that Jesus commands us to go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the great question. So what does this mean? Well, it says they will all know me. I think we all know it's referring to the new covenant in which each believer will receive the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Just find Matthew and turn about three or four pages to the left and get to Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. Now, we've already skipped ahead about old sage from Isaiah, which is about 400 years into the future. We're now more or less at 300 B.C. Now remember that B.C. signifies before Christ. So all this is being written before Christ was even born in the flesh. And yet God, through his prophets, men of God, who were called to give a message, an oracle, a burden to Israel, Gave them a word. He gives them many words. Many words that are very precious. They give prophecies of this Messiah as he comes to be known. The word Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed one. In Old Testament times, if you were going to be given a service, you're going to be given a commission, such as a king, for instance, you'd be anointed with oil. The oil would be poured on your head. And so this anointed one would be one who would have a special task, the most special of tasks. So let's read in Malachi 3, verse 1, the last book of the Old Testament, 300 years before Christ comes. After this book is written, there is 300 years of scriptural silence. <coughs> silence on God's part. Yes, he still has prophets, but there's no more scripture. Until Jesus comes. And the last thing that he says to his people before he's going to be silent, scripturally, is by these words. Behold, I am going to send my messenger. Now the word messenger is actually the same word as the word for angel. Angel actually means messenger. They are messengers of God who come to man to give messages. You can actually hear the word angel in the word evangelize. You hear it? Evangelize. You hear it? It's Greek. It comes from Greek. And it means messenger. So when you're in, what does evangelism mean? Or what does the evangel? In Portuguese, they still have a noun, and we have gospel. The noun word, the noun form of evangelize is the word gospel, which means good news. In Portuguese, it still exists as evangel. It means good message or good word, which comes to us. By an apostle, which apostle just means one who is sent, not messenger too. So you see, it all makes sense now that this messenger is coming. Behold, otherwise known as the Word in John 1 1. And he says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, but this is another one. There are two messengers here. And he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant. In whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. <coughs> Have you ever read this scripture? Did you even know that the Bible said it? God actually told his people, I, myself, soon, quickly, am coming to my temple. I'm going to visit you in Israel. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. That, that word and, and the messenger of the covenant, that's an and that really means, we're still talking about the same man. Sometimes it's translated even, even the messenger. It's one of those cases where you use and, like in the Proverbs, when you're talking about the same man. And he says, and the messenger of the covenant. So he's the messenger of the covenant. Well, what covenant is it? It's the new covenant. The new covenant that was given in Jeremiah. Where God will write on each man's heart his law. And they will all know him. Well, this messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. 
says the Lord. These are his next to last words. Over here in Malachi 4, verse 5, or verse 4, Malachi 4, 4, it says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. It's kind of like a father who's going away on a trip and tells his son, Remember to mind your mother, do this, do that. God's giving him the last instructions before his 300 years of scriptural silence. And he says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, he will restore the hearts of the children to their fathers, and the heart of, of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So this prophet Elijah is going to come and clear the way. Now this is a reference to Isaiah too, also. In Isaiah, this messenger is prophesied about. So that's another scripture for another day. So we turn a few pages over, Look, next thing we count in the New Testament. That word testament could also be translated as covenant. Hebrews actually call it, Jews who are believers actually call it the new covenant. It is the new covenant of In Matthew 3, verse 1, it says, Now in those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness in Judea, of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus tells his disciples later on, John the Baptist was the promised Elijah. He came in the spirit and the power of the former prophet, Elijah, to clear the way for the Lord himself, the messenger of the covenant, who was coming to visit his own temple. The temple is his. The temple in Jerusalem. Verse 3, For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his, around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all his districts around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. To Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is my duty. And I am not fit to remove his sin. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable. That we can see God all the time, all along, ever since the very first book of the Bible, God was prophesying that He would send a Redeemer. Joseph says, My Redeemer lives. God, all through that time, was giving a heads up, as it were. You don't know exactly what's coming, but I'm telling you, He is coming. And he will be the Savior of the world. This is actually the greatest tool that you and I as Christians have today to evangelize the world, at least the part of the world which has an intellectual impediment to the gospel. An intellectual impediment to the belief in God exists. You know, God doesn't exist. Heaven and hell doesn't exist. You know, we don't have to do what he says. God in Deuteronomy in the law, the last of the law, says how will you know, you will know the prophet is false does not tell the truth, a false prophet, because he tells the future and it will not come to pass. He says, you will know a true prophet because what he says in the future will come to pass. It will happen. Jesus on the Mount of Olives said, I tell you these things to his disciples the night he was betrayed, so that when they happen, 
you will know that I am. <coughs> God gives you the precedent that only He can predict the future. We try, we weather men try, but only God can tell the future. And so actually, in this church, we do not go on blind faith. Nay, <coughs> our faith is not blind. We do not put faith in the Quran. The Quran is chock full of anachronisms. The Quran gets Mary, the physical mother of Jesus, and Miriam, the sister of Moses, because Mary is actually the Greek form, Maria is actually the Greek form for Miriam, they're the same name, one's in Hebrew, one's in Greek, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Hebrew. The Quran gets them mixed up and says Moses' sister Miriam was Jesus' mother. It gets them mixed up. It is not inspired by the Word of God. The Book of Mormon is chock full of anachronisms. It gets things wrong. But the only book that gets it all right every time without fail is God's word. Amen. We have every tool we need now that I've given you especially these scriptures and now that you see how amazing it is. You have every tool to evangelize a nation as an intellectual competitor for the gospel. When I was in college, I had a lot of doubts. I doubted it. But I was on campus. And I suffered for it. But now I don't doubt anymore. And you don't have to do that. Because the God's Word tells us that it is true by predicting the future and making it the past. The Dead Sea Scrolls are copies of the Old Testament scriptures which were discovered in a cave in Qumran, the village of Qumran, in modern day Syria, really modern day Israel. Because the boundaries are all um, but Anyway, they're there by the Dead Sea. They were discovered in 1948, just as Israel was becoming a nation. They are carbon dated to 300 BC to the 3rd century BC, and they are copies of the Old Testament scriptures with at least two, with two complete copies of Isaiah. Complete copies with no holes in the parchment. They're complete. And they contain all the words of Isaiah, including those precious prophecies that were given about the suffering servant who would come to take away the sins of the people. So you see, it is proven that these scriptures were written before Jesus came. They were written, they prophesied, Jesus came, and what does he say he does? He fulfills the law. Not a jot, not a tittle, will go away, not a yield, will pass from the law to the law to the field. He did so. He fulfilled all of it. He just proved his fact. It's not a belief. It's, we have faith in what is given by evidence. We have much evidence to believe that every word written in this book, the Holy Bible, is completely, fully true and inerrant and accurate. So what then? Now that we've given the premise that the Word of God is true, what more does it say to you and to me? Well, it says what John the Baptist said. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. We're the trees. I was tough. But we're the trees. The root axe is right here, laid at our roots. And it says every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. It says that the Savior, in verse 12, it says that he has his winnowing fork in his hand. A fork that takes weed and chaff, throws it up in the air, and the chaff falls away, but the wheat falls down. You've got the wheat in your barns to make bread, but the chaff goes and just floats away and becomes compost for future farmers. His women fork it in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff in the principal fire. Well, you say, who are the chaff and who are the wheat? Well, it's sad to say, but at one time or another, we were all chaff. Filthy, good for nothing, light, you blow it, it goes away. It's just chaff. You know, my father replanted, and the chaff just blows away. But the wheat stays. And the wheat is worth something. The wheat does good, it bears fruit. You plant it, it dies. But it grows up, it bears a head. No tell how many. 20, 30, 40 new wheat seeds. The wheat does good and the chaff 
Is he? Well, believe it or not, we're all checked at one point or another. But we don't have to stay that way. We don't have to. We, because of our sin, have transgressed God's word. But he tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So we receive salvation through Jesus' blood, the Lamb who was slain, Passover Lamb, by grace. The word grace in Greek means unmerited or undeserved favor. He looks on you with favor. You don't deserve it, but you get it. Ain't that our story? That's what we get. And it says, you have been saved through faith. Not out of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So it's not by faith. I mean, excuse me. It's not by works. It's by faith. And it says, not a result of works so that no one may boast. You can't even boast about it. Oh, look at me. I've done a good job. No, nope, can't do it. It's by faith. In Philippians 1, 21-26, it says these words. Now, we've already laid the premise of why God's word is true. We've already laid the premise of why we need Jesus. Because we're chaff, we're sinners, in one point in our life or another, we've been wicked, selfish, evil. We do what we want to do all the time. But we do not do what God wants. As a result, it says our righteousness is as filthy as. But, on the contrary, Christ lived that perfect life. That so what you can see in his mouth. He becomes our righteousness. Therefore, we've already laid the reason the word, that God's word is true. If we're go, going at a logical exercise, we're going to use some logic to determine what we need to do. Okay, we've determined God's word is true. All the prophecies that are given beforehand, they're fulfilled. That's number one. Okay, His word is true. That's assumption one. Not really an assumption, I'm just proving. So number two, it tells us that we're chaff. And the chaff will be burned on quenchable fire. It will not be quenched. It will not go out. It will last for eternity. It's called hell. But it says there's a way out. It says, For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, talking to the church, those who have been saved. And if you have, you cannot wait till tomorrow. Because tomorrow will be too late. You have to accept him today. When you know you still have time. Now tomorrow, if tomorrow comes and you hadn't died, great. Then tomorrow's the day you better accept. But you better do it before time is up. We have the word. We know it's true. Our assumption one proves it's true. Assumption two tells us we need to save it. We need him to save us from our sins. And the way we do that is by confessing, believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, Jesus, our Savior, the suffering servant, and then confessing with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's the second purpose. When you don't have Jesus, and when you understand what I've told you just now, you are now accountable. If you understand the words that I'm saying, you understand you're a sinner, you need Jesus, you're accountable. You have to accept it in your heart. But guess what? It's free. Now, church, you who are saved, he says in Philippians 1.21, that for to me, this is Paul speaking, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know what it is to do. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better. Heaven is Christ. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary, he says, for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you, or I remain absent, or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind starting together for the faith of God. Paul was not sure whether or not he would be executed at this time. He wanted to go be with the Lord, because he knew that heaven is far greater than you. Neither eye has seen nor ear has heard the things that he has stored up for those. 
We do not know of one who is away. Ms. Brenda Pickett knows, but we don't. We don't know yet. Neither I have seen nor ears heard. So he wanted to go to heaven. But he said, For you it is better that I stay, because I am a missionary to you. I am a pastor to you. He was telling to a church that he had already been a missionary to. He had now went on to another church and entrusted the word with them to keep growing and sharing. So Paul tells us that for him, he had to stay. Why did he have to stay? Because God had given him a charge. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says these words. I turn to first. He says these words in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, but we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse <coughs> while we are in this tent, we groan, we pray, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave it to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, and we are of good courage, I say. And prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deed in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. So knowing the fear of the Lord, that His day of wrath is coming, that those who are not found in Him will be burned up like chaff, we persuade the men. That is our task, church. That is your task. Every day of your life, your task is to persuade men. You are persuaders. You are to take this word, and you are to learn it. And you are to know how to see, as we say it, as we saw, how it is true, and you must be persuaded. Amen. It says over in Mark, the third, the second gospel, in Mark 10, 28, Jesus just told the disciples how it is hard for someone to get into heaven. He says it's easier for a camel, in verse 25, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they're even more, they're even more astonished and said to him, "Who can be saved?" Look at him, looking at him, Jesus said, "The people it, it is impossible, but with not with God, for all things are possible with God." And then in verse 28, Peter says something very interesting. He says, "Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you.'" Jesus said, "Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers." or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or farms, for my sake, and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now, in the present age, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and farms, along with persecutions, but in the age to come, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. God calls us all to a unique task. He calls some to even leave home, mother, father, children, farms. He calls them to go and to preach the word, to go and to give it. And he says that they will receive a hundredfold in this life. Brothers, sisters, houses, mothers, children, farms, along with persecution. They will be persecuted. But in the age and in the age to come, eternal life. So therefore, my brothers, we have every commandment that we need to know what is the right to do. We've been given the premise of how God's word is completely and utterly true. We've been given the premise that we are sinners, that we need a savior. And also we've been given the charge that those of us who have been saved have been called to attack, to persuade men. Turn from evil, turn to Jesus to receive that salvation before it's too late. 
And even to some of us, he calls us to leave children, farms, mothers, farms, and go off and be, as the Bible says, apostles, which the word apostle means just simply one who is sent. One who is sent with a message to be evangelized. A word, which is the word, which is Jesus himself. The gospel, the gospel is Jesus himself. The word who became flesh. <coughs> this brings us back to the last, not the last, but the very most important verse of the Bible. And I'll read it to you just to do a little boasting. Actually, I'm not boasting. But I'll read it to you in its form in which it was originally penned. In the Gospel of John, in the third chapter, the 16th verse, it says, Kutos God, Egapisim, Hotheos, Tom Cosmon, Hoste Tom Vion, Tom Nubinet, Manogene, Edokin, Hina, Pas, Hopiskuo, Ace, Alton, Me, Apaleta, Alepe, Zoe, Iomia which is translated to English, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This word that I read to you is in the language of Greece, in the Greek language, Koine Greek, written in the first century AD. These, my friends, you have just heard today, the very words of God himself. You've heard the word originally, but you hear what it says. It says, For he loves the world so much that he gives his only begotten Son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And it says in John 3 17, For the Son did not come into the world, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. He did not. But that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This morning, uh, I'm going to ask Brother Wade to come and the musicians to come as well. This morning, if you have a need for the Savior, now is the time to accept it. This morning, if you've been called to special service, haven't yet confessed. He is calling, perhaps. But you be the judge of that. But let your heart tell you. Let the Holy Spirit within you tell you what he's asking. He will, he will call you if he does. He calls you that special service. Those of you who are Christians, you are called, whether or not you may think so, to be persuaders of men. Persuade those that this word is true in every letter of the word. So let's stand right now. As we begin to sing, I want you to pray the Lord that He would tell your heart that this is so important. All His words are true. Every sin that He says is a sin is a sin. It's a sin as dark as it be. It's wicked. You need to cast it out of your mind. But you also need to know it is by grace you're saved, not by works. And it's given you freely. And now you are free to live. You live by grace, not by works. Free to life, to tell his truth, being persuaders of men. And if God has called you, perhaps to leave home, to be a minister of the gospel, whatever that be. If any of those applies to you, please come. We will help you. We're here to help you. We're not here to hinder you. Please come. Talk to